I am so glad to be able to speak to you, especially after the great encouragement that we had this week going to Winter Extreme. I know I posted pictures of the bands on the stage, and usually I tried to get a picture where the name of the band was up behind them on the big screen, and, uh, you know, I, I did that because the bands are recognizable. At least you can go Google them, and you can probably Google the speakers too, but I want you to understand every session had a worship band, an in-house worship band, where we worshiped the Lord, not just the singers on the stage, although they put on a pretty good rock show too, style of, of stage presence, but it was intended for everyone to sing along, and we sang along to worship songs, and we worshiped the Lord together, and then a speaker came out, and the speakers were all very challenging. Men of God who have dedicated their lives to big events like that where they can touch the hearts of uh, teenagers, maybe in a special way that your boring old pastor can't, uh, but anyways, uh, we... Uh, we got to hear some stories, some things were explained uh, to us. In fact, one of the ones that I felt was uh, probably the most powerful uh, was from a guy named Tom Richter. And I, I, I mean, I'm, he's cool enough that I actually bragged to the kids I've met him before. You know, I actually went uh, before he was doing the speaking tour thing. He was planting a church in Queens, New York. And uh, in college, we went on a mission trip to help him out. And uh, so I, I actually got to say hi to him. And uh, of course, he, I was just one of many mission teams that went in there. But he spoke about training and he challenged us, you know, would you expect to win a football game if you weren't practicing? Would you expect to learn an instrument if you weren't dedicating time to that? Well, your whole life is about living the Christian life. And, and the challenges from the world, the flesh and the devil come. And how can we expect to face those things if we are taking no time for our Christian training, for our Bible reading, for our prayer, for our learning from leaders and all of those things. And I thought, man, this is why I need to be listening to these guys. They're not going to tell me any spiritual, they may not tell me any spiritual or theological truth I haven't heard of before, but man, these guys can relate it so much better. And so I hope to be uh, an important resource to you in your spiritual training. Uh, today we are going to look about look at why you don't have to fear. Now of course this will not be a guilt trip about fear. You are going to experience fear. Everybody in here is going to experience fear. I experience fear on a regular basis. We recently purchased a very large and heavy bus and it's even heavier when it's full of teenagers and luggage. And I was very proud of some of our girls. Uh, there was once a movie where they referred to Her Royal Highness's matched luggage, and it was huge luggages. And I asked one of the girls uh, that's been with us several times, is this Her Royal Highness's matched luggage? And uh, she actually brought, a, they all brought smaller bags this time. So we weren't loaded down quite as much as we had been in the past. But if, as you know, when a, the heavier a vehicle weighs, the longer it takes to come to a full and complete stop in an emergency. And so I had genuine fear driving around, th this time around with the snow and ice on the roads this Sunday. Last year, if you'll remember, I slid off the road into the ditch. It had more to do with not paying attention to how bald my front tires were than my actual uh, driving, but it made me more sensitive to the issues this morning that surround having church on an icy day like today. I have certainly seen it worse, but it is still fairly slick out there. Uh, fear is normal and natural, and I'm going to say that because we live in a scary world. And in many ways, it is becoming scarier and scarier. And in many parts of the world, violence is increasing in our own country. We have seen many cities see their violence increase. And we're a bit insulated from that out where we live. But violence is on the rise. And then, of course, there is social fear. We now live in an age where you can go to someone and the fact that they are wearing a mask in public or the fact that they are not 
wearing their mask in public might make the anger rise in you or seeing you with your mask on or not your mask on might make the anger rise with them. And there is so much political animosity. And with social media, we feel like, yes, older folks, I know you're, most of you are not on it. And the ones that are on Facebook are able to watch us this morning, unless you've gone to our website where it is also streaming. But, uh, please understand for the younger generations, every wrong thing they've ever done is going to live forever. And their friends, many things that our friends would have said behind our backs and we would never have the stress of knowing is now published for all the world to see about how chubby we are or about the stupid thing that we said or, or even just outright lies about us. Our world is a scary place and it is becoming even scarier. I was led today uh, to bring you to the book of John. So if you want to go ahead and be uh, turning to John chapter 15, that is where we're going to start out. I have a few choice scriptures that we're going to go through. And, uh, but I wanted to tell you the story once upon a time when my father was still alive, he came to the St. Louis area and there was going to be this big event happening at some big church. I can't remember where it was actually located, but uh, it was possible for your church to get the feed and host an official satellite of this thing. We've done this with Priscilla Schreier's uh, uh, conference in the past for the ladies. and uh, But it was one of these things where pastors, and it was called the elephant room, and it was a reference to the old saying, you know, there's an elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about, but it's big and it's and it's in the way, and we all see it, but no one wants to talk about it. And so it was various pastors from different denominations, different kinds of churches, and they were going to sit down, and the promise was that they were going to discuss the things that nobody else wanted to discuss. And for the younger generation of us preachers, that's a big deal, you know. I think the older generation already knows where they all disagree, and so they politely agree not to talk about it or things like that, you know. But I thought, you know, my dad's going to be in town that same weekend. It's a pastor's conference. We're both pastors, something we can bond over. And he came and some of, some of the stuff that was really trendy among younger pastors kind of, I, I learned that the real show was watching my dad's facial expressions uh, because, you know, like, why are they so concerned about this thing? This thing isn't a big issue. It's like, it is to us, you know, younger generations. But uh, there was one thing where the all of those and of course you know they're all famous pastors so they're all mega church pastors each one of them had a story about their mental breakdown that they had in ministry and this really twisted up my dad's face i mean for one guy to admit that he had had mental health issues and everything was probably normal. But when, when all of them started, all of the younger guys started talking about the day that they went jogging and suddenly broke down crying, or the day that, uh, the day that they were hiding in the back behind where they speak and they just couldn't talk themselves into going out and facing that huge crowd, my dad was like, what is going on, man? It reminds me a little bit of that scene from the movie A League of Their Own. I love Tom Hanks. A League of Their Own is about... Uh, when the Major League Baseball recruited female players because it was World War II era and the men had gone to fight. And uh, there's this memorable scene where this poor woman is crying because her coach is yelling at her and he's used to dealing with men. So he doesn't know what to do to get her to quit crying. So he yells at her some more. It's not as bad as it sounds. I promise it belong it it's it's a touching it's it's a it's just a funny scene in the movie where he tells her there's no crying in baseball and i think my dad was thinking there's no crying in pastoral care in pastoral leadership what are these guys talking about but mental health issues are on the rise and it not only affects, see, we as Christians like to think that we are protected from it. Those of us who have not necessarily dealt with depression or anxiety and things like that, we like to think that we are insulated from it because Jesus saved us and therefore everything is hunky-dory. And to some degree, that is what you need to hang on to. But it's out there and it's affecting Christians and there's great Christian leaders that we all looked up to in the past and then uh, some, many times their downfall has something to do with mental anguish and if you go looking in the bible you may not see depression or you may not see well you will see the word anxiety uh but you will see addiction in the form of idolatry 
you will see, do not be anxious about anything, but in all things, give thanks to the Lord. And don't worry, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that all you need is Jesus. And so don't bother with taking your medication. If it helps, take it. If it doesn't help, go to your doctor, tell them how it's not helping or describe to him every detail you possibly can and they will adjust it and they will find what works for you if that is what you need in this time. But I also want you to know that as, as your uh, issues progress, as you continue in your life, you need to understand that things like anxiety and depression, unless you find a chemical or something in your life, a food allergy that is just plain causing it, Ultimately, even though the prescribed medications might help, ultimately anxiety, depression, uh, fear, which is what I, the term I'm using this morning, ultimately, though you can use medications to help with the, uh, negate the effects, ultimately at the root of it, I do believe it's going to be turn out to be a spiritual issue. And so why do Christians not have to be afraid? Well, in Jesus' final words before going to the cross and in the Gospel of John, Jesus talks for several chapters, final words. And when you hear somebody's final words, if you've ever lost someone, someone's final words are usually the important things that they want to pass on to you. As a part of Jesus' final words, I have a few select passages from John 15, 16 through 21. Jesus tells his disciples and John records it in such a way that it speaks to us through the generations. That's probably how Jesus said it, actually. John 15, starting in 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now, oh, got into 22 there, didn't I? Yep. Because they do not know him who sent me. Jesus tells us. Now, keep in mind that Jesus is speaking to his own. And so, because Jesus is speaking to us who know Jesus, he is offering us words of comfort, words of warning. You see, when you go out expecting everything to be rosy and, and, uh, and then you face the disappointment that things are not as happy and cheerful, that's a great letdown. But, but if you have more realistic expectations, you can mitigate what is going to happen for many of us this is like a walking depression or a constant depression we just go out there not wanting to ever be let down so we expect the worst and i don't necessarily want to tell you that that's the answer but we need we don't need pessimistic expectations we don't need overly optimistic expectations although those can come in handy we need realistic expectations. And Jesus says, if you are following me, they will hate you. In fact, uh, there's a lot of love at church. In fact, if you wanted to read the whole speech, Jesus tells us love one another. And one of the reasons is out in the world, they're going to hate you. So you need love. So come to church and love one another. Show each other the benefit of the doubt. Forgive one another. Be united. You're going to need it. Because everyone that doesn't belong to God not only hates God, but they hate the son that he sent. And not only do they hate the son that he sent, but they hate anyone who represents him. Now, keep in mind, our battle is not against flesh and blood. We must love and pray for the person. And if they are deceived, if they have believed lies from the devil, we need to pray that they come out from those lies. And we need to come out and we need to blast with a 
you know, whatever your metaphor wants to be, we need to fight the lies. We don't need to fight the person. Sometimes there is not going to be a lot of difference. That person is not going to want to give you much space between them as a person and them and their beliefs. In fact, I believe that is the campaign of the devil right now, is to convince the world that doesn't know God and doesn't want God and wants to be in rebellion against God, is to convince them that if the church doesn't accept every single sinful thing that you do and every single sinful thing that you believe, they don't love you at all. When they say they love you, don't believe them. That is the lie of the devil that is out there. And we need to exercise the ability to love the person but still understand the problem with the sin and the lies that they have believed. And so we need to draw that distinction, even though as we draw it, the world wants to take that pencil out of our hand and throw it away and say, you have no right to try to separate me from my sin. But that is exactly what Jesus wants to do. And Jesus tells them, they hate me, therefore they are going to hate you. Now that is not comforting. Like I said, it speaks to realistic expectations that when we do the right thing, the world is going to be upset about it. But it isn't necessarily that comforting. And what if, what if you're wondering the question right now, then why don't we just not follow Jesus? Because that sounds really difficult and I don't want to do it. There's an argument to be made there. Jesus calls us to this and he says we don't have to be afraid, but I want to dwell for a minute on why Jesus is worth it. And if you skip down, we're still in John 15, but we're going to skip down to John 15, 26. John 15, 26 says, but when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will bear witness about me and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. And yeah, I went into the, an extra verse there, didn't I? Well, maybe not. The fact of the matter is we have so much in Jesus. I want to assure you that whatever we suffer for Jesus is absolutely absolutely worth it. It is absolutely worth it because when the helper comes, and that is the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me and you will learn all things. You will learn all things. We get to know the God of the universe. And I'm sure if you're watching this, you're probably already familiar with the gospel message that we were born into rebellion, that we resist God, that we are sinful. But praise be to God, God did not want to leave us that way. And even though going with the flow in this world seems comfortable for now, God's flow is coming and God is going to correct everything that is wrong in this world. And unfortunately, if you are still on the side that has believed lies and loves your sin at that point, there is coming a time when God, and he's the only one who has the authority to do this, but he's going to say it's too late. We can never turn to anyone who doesn't know God and say it's too late. We don't do that. That is not our authority. We're given lots of authority through the Holy Spirit, but that is not our place. We tell everybody, if you're breathing, if you hear my message, it is not too late. But someday God's going to say it's too late. And someday God's purposes will be finished and he'll bring it to completion. And everybody that loves the Lord will go home to be with him. And everyone else still in rebellion is uh, consigned to an eternal punishment with the rebellious angels, the devils, the demons, Satan himself. And so we have everything. If, if, the, if the idea before from the verses before was too much, oh my gosh, why did I sign up for persecution? Why I'm so glad Pastor Travis is warning me about this. I don't want to sign up for persecution. What you're going to miss out on if you don't want the persecution is Jesus. Jesus is everything. 
Jesus is the greatest man you've ever met. Jesus loves you more than anyone on earth that you could ever possibly think of. Jesus has given up more for you. Jesus is the strongest big brother anybody's ever had. Jesus defeats all the principalities and the powers. Jesus shows you a way. Jesus may not calm your storm, but he shows you how to walk on water. Jesus loves you. Jesus came and died on the cross. There is nothing more that Jesus can do to show you how much he loves you because he has already shown you ultimate love. And so we sign up for Jesus. We sign up for Jesus and he gives us realistic expectations. They hated me. They crucified me. They are not going to want to hear your message. But praise be to God that when we do preach his message, the people that God is after will hear it. Maybe not the first time they might not respond. Maybe not the second time. Maybe not the sixth time. I remember a statistic from years ago in evangelism class that, that people had to hear on average about seven times before they would give in and God is after those people and God wants us to reach out and give those people that opportunity and we may plant the seed and not see the results or we may come along and water what somebody else planted metaphorically as we share the gospel with them but at some point hopefully as we may not be able to control what comes into their lives God is able to control what comes into their lives and so God sees to it that even when we can't be the seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty 10, 20 people, those 20 times that someone witnesses to somebody, if something prevents us from continuing, God can send someone else and those people are going to come to Jesus. And I want there be a flame of fire set in your heart that not only would you believe in Jesus, but that you would see his will for your life and how he wants you you to spread his message and to advance his kingdom because he is so gracious enough that he has allowed us to help with this work. We're going to move on down to chapter 16, verses 32 and 33. And these, these are your memory verses, at least the last one, or at least the last phrase of the last one, because I love when Jesus says, fear not. In the world you will have trouble, but fear not. I have overcome the world. Let's read the whole thing here, starting in verse 32. Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus is warning them. His time of crucifixion is coming and uh, Jesus is God and man. He is divine and he is human. And it's who knows how much he is able to foretell as human Jesus exactly what is going to happen that night. But he knows it's bad. He goes and he prays and he's sweating and the blood vessels have burst in his sweat gland so that it there's blood coming out of his. He is super nervous. There's blood coming out of his sweat pores his sweat glands, and he is super nervous. That is a high-stress physiological response, and he is praying to God. He even says, Lord, I would that you would let this cup pass from me, an old idiom for saying, Lord, I wish someone else could do this job. And that's Jesus talking. Jesus experiencing something like fear, something like anxiety about what is about to happen. And yet... He submits to the will of the Father. And he's telling all of them, when it goes down, you will be scattered. Something big is about to happen and you will be scattered, each to his own home and will leave me alone. Yet I'm not alone for the Father is with me. And then he gives them words that they can treasure after he is crucified. And of course, after he is risen from the dead in victory and they can remember what it was like to see their friend who they saw die publicly and stay dead for a day or two and be risen from the dead and have power over death. They could remember these words. And of course, John remembered them well enough that he was able to write them in his gospel. I have said these things to you that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome 
the world. Sometimes we preachers forget to explain what we mean when we say the world. The world is the rest of the world outside of those who do not believe in Jesus. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, the whole world fell into darkness. And we have continued that. And there have been better governments and there have been worse governments. But only until the last few hundred years have there been governments trying to run things according to God's will. Pagan governments, secular governments, some of them a little better than others, but from God's perspective, this whole world is ran by sinful people and whether they know it or not their god that they follow is the devil instead of the true god and so jesus says fear not that whole system of the world the rest of the world that is set against us if you've ever felt like we're just a small minority you are right but that whole system of the world that is set against us i have already defeated it and that Jesus is the Jesus who wants to come and live in your heart. And that Jesus who has comfort for you when you are hurting and power for you when you are afraid. That Jesus wants to come and dwell within you. The Holy Spirit wants to dwell within you and teach you all things. Jesus had had three years of opportunities living with, camping out with these 12 men. And he said, I still wasn't able to teach you everything, but I'm sending the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will come into you and he will teach you all things. And I want you to remember that by the Holy Spirit, those men wrote the Bible. And so there is a textbook for the Christian life. And there is also personal revelation from God about what God wants you to do. And it needs to be informed by what God has said in his Bible. The two are never going to disagree. And I pray today that you would do one of two things. Number one, if you don't know Jesus and you don't have this prize that we are talking about, where you get to have Jesus and you get to have the Holy Spirit and you get to have all of the things that Jesus promises. You don't know this man who is the greatest man to ever walk the earth, the kindest man to ever walk the earth, the most merciful and forgiving man to ever walk the earth. If you don't know him, you need to meet him today. If, if anything that I have said about Jesus has stirred your heart, turn to God and say, God, I want to follow you. Please forgive me of my sins. Jesus, come into my heart and save me, and he will. And then we want to know that you've made that decision. And you're all, if you're already on Facebook watching this, you can message me. Of course, everybody in the church has my phone number. If you want to talk about spiritual things, if you want to tell me you've made some kind of decision like that, call me and tell me, text me and tell me. We will talk. We will talk about next steps. And if you are a believer in Jesus, but you don't know about all this persecution stuff, we are starting a study where Christians who go through real persecution, not the little stuff that we sometimes complain about here or the fact that we're seeing what's happening politically and we say to ourselves, oh, you know what? That looks like it may be the beginning of a slippery slope. No, real physical torture and persecution. We are starting a study. We want to involve you in that study somehow. And, and we want to talk about what it means. It's near and dear to my heart because when I was 16, we went to Eastern Europe and we met so many of the Christians who had lived through this kind of thing. And so uh, eventually we'll do a, a different study about what it's like to live in the Muslim world, a little bit more modern, a little bit more recent. Uh, but, but, but there are many, even though the Soviet Union is gone, there are many governments like, like China that are still under that model or at least a similar model. And so I pray that you will... Uh, not question what it means to suffer for Jesus, but that you would be willing, that you would assign Jesus that place in your heart that says, this is the best thing in my life and I want it. I want more of it no matter what, even if they tell me I'm wrong, even if they tell me it makes me hateful, even if they tell me all kinds of lies about what it means to follow Jesus, I want to follow Jesus. And I pray that for you today. Lord Jesus, I want to pray for everybody that's watching the live stream and our little family that is here gathered in this, uh, uh, my little immediate family and, and, and uh, 
those I treat like family, Lord, that are gathered here in this building and also everyone watching this live stream. Lord, I pray for our church members. I hope and pray that the live stream worked out well for them. I pray for those who are part of our church family but maybe haven't joined it yet. I hope the live stream worked out well for them. Lord, I pray for anyone connected to me or anyone that uh, might have just said, hey, you know, let's see what's going to be on the internet today and they found our live stream because they went to high school with me years ago or whatever the case may be lord i pray for them that they would turn their life over to you to you and that we would see that our anxieties and things uh, they might be complicated problems to solve but lord show us at the root of the problem that if we trust you and if we are humble and not prideful and that if we are thankful for what you've provided for us that we will have less anxiety and that we can go forward with confidence knowing that we are a child of you. Lord, I pray for everyone that isn't a child of you. Lord, don't give them a restful night. Chase after them. Speak to their heart until they want to be a child of yours. In Jesus' name, amen.